Amen. If you are able to, would you continue standing as you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter four will begin reading in verse twelve. First Peter four verse twelve, and we'll read on down to the end of the chapter there. Holy Spirit, writing through Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you also may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will become of what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Let's pray. Holy Father, we come before you now. And Lord, we thank you that you are our rock and our redeemer. We thank you that despite whatever is going on in our lives, Lord, whether it's we're facing these fiery trials and the sufferings and hardships that Peter speaks of here, or maybe things are going rather smoothly. Lord, we thank you that you are our rock and an anchor for us. So that we can stand not on our own strength, but stand upon you and the strength that you have provided for us. Lord God, I ask now that you would be glorified through the preaching of your word, that every heart might confess that Christ is Lord. Sometimes when I uh, coach baseball, um, I think our athletes think I just want to make them hurt, uh, make them feel pain through running. And, uh, you know, we tell them to go run. And you would think, like, we're asking them to do something awful. But what they don't realize is that in baseball, and just like with any sport, running is incredibly important. You have distance running that you have to go through so that you have endurance to play nine innings, uh, so that you have endurance to play multiple games a week. That's why we have distance running. And they don't like that. But when they're tired in that seventh inning or the ninth inning, we go into extra innings, that's why we tell them we make them run. And so they still have something left in the tank. Or you have sprints that's good for their muscles and for quickness as they're exploding, as they're trying to get from base to base, or as they're throwing off the mound and making quick movements. But they still don't like it because it's painful. And you know, that's sort of similar to the difficulties that we go through in our lives. Sometimes we think, why is this happening to me? Why am I suffering? Why are there so many hardships and trials and difficulties that I'm facing? Maybe we even question, God, why are you having me go through this? And you know, Peter has an answer for that here in our text this morning. As we look at, at, at verses 12 through 17, what, what, as, and we look at our text, what we're going to see is we're going to see how we can survive and grow through suffering. In this text here in First Peter chapter four, it's actually the third time now that that Peter has called his believers to endure suffering. And, and just remember, at this point in the Roman Empire, in which Peter is writing, the widespread empire-wide persecution of Christians has not happened fully yet. At this point, there's just local persecutions popping up here and there. And it's almost as if, you know, when you stand on the edge of an ocean, you see a storm coming and you you see the waves are are, are, are are rising, the tides getting higher. You see the white caps out. You see the wind. You feel the wind blowing. The, the, the dark clouds are coming in. The storm is coming. 
Peter is standing there and he's viewing what is happening. He's seeing how Christianity is growing rapidly. He's seeing how believers are being ostracized and being looked down upon. And he's writing to them here in this in this letter to prepare for the storm that is approaching. And you know, Rome was not opposed to certain types of religious diversity. Uh, when we went throughout Rome uh, a couple months ago, they had altars all over the place. They had all kinds of gods. They did not mind certain types of re- religious diversity. They also did not, uh, they did not like new religions. They did not like rapidly growing religions. They did not like religions that were exclusive and said that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the only way. The the Roman Empire didn't mind all of those other religions as long as their empire was supreme. You know, in our country, Christians, we have lived often with general ease, haven't we? But if you kind of go back and you actually look at times in the early colonies, you'll actually find that Baptists were persecuted. They were persecuted and beaten and imprisoned, but that was not the norm for most of the church in America. Most of the time, the church in America lived with relative ease, right? But don't we see the tide today starting to rise a little bit, don't we? You know, maybe we face mockery. Maybe people dismiss Christian beliefs. Christianity is often made fun of in philosophy classes on secular campuses. and We have various Christian ministries that, that are beginning to be ostracized, all the while LGBTQ plus groups are receiving the blessings of secular universities. But despite all of that, there's not full-on persecution, right? But we're facing things similar today that the, that, that the people that Peter was writing to were facing. Similar to what Peter was, was happening in Peter's day, believers beginning to be marginalized, pushed to the edges of society. Now, while we don't face full-on persecution, let's also not forget our brothers and sisters overseas who do not have the the various freedoms that we have had, right? Who don't have the various ease that we have had in our nation. And let's not forget them in our prayers. And let's see their persecution in the midst of fiery trials that Peter speaks of here as an encouragement to us today. So how can we survive suffering? How can we survive these fiery trials and not just survive and hang on, but actually grow through suffering and grow through fiery trials? And and Peter is going to give us eight starting points here for, for surviving and growing through suffering. Eight principles for surviving and growing in the midst of suffering and trials. First of all, in verse 12, I'll lay this out for you. Uh, He says, do not be surprised when you suffer. Second, you'll notice that these are also on the back of your bulletin. Rejoice in the midst of suffering from verse 13. Third, we'll see that he says you are blessed in your sufferings, verse 14. Verse 15, he says, do not suffer for your own wrongdoing. Verse 16 is, do not be ashamed of your suffering. Verse 17 is, God will purify and save his people. And then number seven, from verse 17 and 18, is judgment will will come upon unbelievers. And then verse 19, entrust yourself to God. Now, before you get too concerned, we're only going to go over part one today. All right. We're only going to go over four parts. It's not an eight part sermon, although I may have felt like it. Uh, the kids after Sunday school gave me three donut holes. So I was thinking, well, maybe I could do all points today, all eight points today, but I'll spare you from that. I did tell them, hey, every donut hole you give me, it's five uh, extra minutes on the sermon. No. So when the storms of life begin to beat you down. When you're tempted to give up, brothers and sisters, let these truths that Peter lays out for us here, let them give you hope to endure in the midst of your fiery trials. First of all, let's take a look at that first principle of do not be surprised when you suffer. The first truth, the first principle that that, that Peter gives us is not just survive, but also grow through our suffering and our trials, is to not be surprised surprised when you face them. He says, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. 
So Peter tells us here, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when uh, when you face these things. He, he he tells them, don't be surprised. And he begins this section with actually this imperative. It's it's a command to not be surprised when you suffer. So we shouldn't be surprised because we know that we live in a world that is broken and sinful. And, and so Peter here is explaining to us and showing us that we need to understand the nature of our suffering and our trials, and it begins with understanding the nature of them, is that they are not strange. The word he uses there is, they're not strange. They're not foreign or strange to us. And understanding this, that they are not strange, that sufferings and difficulties and hardships are not strange and foreign, is a major part of the battle. When you know that you will face trials and hardships in this life, that's a helpful beginning point. Instead of being caught off guard when you face a fiery trial. This is a better understanding. This is a better uh, starting point when we understand that these are not foreign to us. We should not be surprised when we face difficulties. When we get word of the passing of a loved one. Or we get word of, uh, 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 of a terminal illness in our own lives or in the life of someone that we love. And, and to understand that these things are going to happen in life. And we need to view them in this way, in which Peter is discussing here. What we'll see is that when we view the fiery trials that we face and the way that Peter is laying out for us here, we'll actually see how they can be beneficial to us, to our growth, so that we will not only survive, but actually grow. Here, Peter calls them a fiery trial. You see that there in verse 12? Be surprised at these fiery trials. Now, if you were to look at Revelation 3, verse 18, Jesus actually uses a similar word there. He's speaking, addressing the church at Laodicea. And he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. In other words, what we see here is this wording involves kind of pointing us towards gold that's being refined, gold that's being purified in a refiner's fire, a fire that purifies and cleanses, a fire in which you put gold and all of the impurities that that, that come with it when it's taken out of the earth, and out comes pure, pure gold that is refined. Last week in Sunday school, we were going through We've been working our way through the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, and we looked at our statement of faith last week in regards to salvation and how salvation is just a beautiful gift from the Lord that includes regeneration. It includes new birth. It includes justification, being declared righteous, and it includes sanctification, where we're growing in holiness, growing in Christ's likeness. And when it comes to salvation, uh, to sanctification, We talked about that process in which we go through throughout our entire lives of growing in holiness. And one of the means that God uses to grow us into maturity, to grow us into Christ's likeness, is through these fiery trials that Peter mentions here. Uh, I was reading a story this last week of a pastor. He asked a silversmith, he said, how do you know the silver is purified enough? And the silversmith said to him, I look into it and I see my image reflected. in it." And, you know, that's what God is doing, brothers and sisters. That's what God is doing with us. When we go through trials, when we go through hardships, we're being sanctified. We we're growing in holiness and Christ likeness in order to be made more into the image of Christ. As the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image. And so sanctification, growing in holiness, going through these fiery trials, is meant to do what? It's meant to test us. It's meant to refine us. It's meant to to purify us and make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter is telling us here, he says, don't be surprised when you go through these things. And you know, Peter learned his lesson, didn't he? Peter 
had learned his lesson about suffering. The one who actually rebukes the Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus said that Jesus said that he was going to suffer and die on the cross. What did Peter do? He said, no, 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 no. And he rebuked him, right? For saying that he would suffer. But Peter has come to learn that the call to follow Jesus is a call to die to ourselves. A call to pick up our crosses and follow him daily. Believers, Christ has saved us from sin, but not from suffering. And so we see that that, that when we understand that that we shouldn't be surprised by these things, that these fiery trials and hardships that we face in this life, that they're not strange to us, they're not foreign to us, we actually see we can begin to see what God is doing, that God is using them to grow us, conform us more into the image of His Son. Not so that we just survive and hold on, but we actually grow. So the second thing, that the second principle or point that that Peter gives us for surviving and growing and suffering now is we're called to rejoice in the midst of suffering. We see that in verse 13. We're to rejoice in the midst of suffering. He says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Friends, when you suffer, when you face fiery trials, Do you rejoice or do you complain? How easy it is for us to complain. I mean, we are pretty good about complaining. I mean, I think we can find just about anything to complain about as humans, right? In our sinful nature. How easy in our sinful nature it is to complain. But here, as Peter is showing us, because we are not surprised by fiery trials, we should actually see them as opportunities for rejoicing. First, think about it this way. If Jesus were the only sinless and perfect person to ever live, if he suffered and he was rejected, so will we. If Jesus was actually able to also go to the cross and bear our sins, uh, bear our sins on the cross and suffer and die, and actually as Hebrews 12, 2 puts it, that we're to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame. You hear that? It says that Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him. If Jesus is able to do that, go and face the, the greatest suffering and punishment the, the history of the world it will ever see, facing the punishment of God for our sins, and he was able to do that with joy. If Jesus is able to endure suffering and shame, going to the cross for our sins, and certainly we can look to him And rejoice when we're given the opportunity to participate in his sufferings. How do we do this? It's a lot easier said than done, right? But how do we do this? It's because our joy is not anchored in our circumstances. No, our joy is anchored in Christ. As we just sung about, our rock and our redeemer. And friends, unless you suffer in this life, unless there are troubles in your life, unless you face grief and loss and difficulties and hardships, you don't really know what you trust in. You may say, well, yes, I trust in God. I live for Him. I worship Him. But maybe you actually live for many other things alongside Him that you trust in as well. Maybe you trust in your finances. Maybe you trust in your possessions or relationships. And you know, you have no idea how much you trust in them until they are threatened or you lose them. And so the way that we respond to our suffering demonstrates whether or not our profession of Christ is genuine. Did you profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because of the supposed benefits that he could give to you? Or because he truly and genuinely is your Savior and Lord, deserving of your full allegiance? Did you come to Jesus for him to serve you? Or did you come to him for you to serve him? Friend, are you his servant or do you think he is your servant? There's a world of difference between the two. When we think that Jesus just exists for our service, what happens when you face trials and hardships then is you don't rejoice. 
and you turn your back on him. So how can we rejoice in the midst of suffering? We look to Christ and see what he endured for us. But we also keep in mind that suffering isn't the end. You see what he writes here? He says, but you rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So how can we rejoice in the midst of suffering that you're in, the fiery trials that you're facing right now at this very moment? No, brother, no, sister. That that suffering is not the end. That the fire of your trials has an expiration date. It has a boundary. It can only go so far. Why do we say that from verse 13? Because there is a day when Christ's glory is revealed. In other words, when he'll return. Jesus is coming back and he has defeated sin and death. And one day he's going to come back and all of the effects of sin will be no more. As we saw from Revelation 21, right? In the new creation. There will be no more sin. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more fiery trials for those who have trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But those who do not repent. They will face the fiery trial of God's wrath and hell for all eternity. So, friend, you are in the midst of a fiery trial right now. Know that that suffering, that fiery trial that you are going through has an expiration. date. It will not continue forever. There will be a day when the glory of God is revealed in your life and you will see not just through faith, but your faith will become sight. And those difficulties will be no more for all eternity. So that's the second principle for not just surviving, but through growing through suffering. The third one that we see is you're actually blessed in your sufferings from verse 14. As if saying that we should rejoice in the midst of our sufferings is crazy enough, Peter actually says, you're blessed. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> right? He says, we're blessed in our sufferings. Isn't he at verse 14? If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Friends, when people look at you and they insult you for being a follower of Jesus, Peter's saying, you're actually blessed. Similar to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verses 11 through 12, he says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, not just rejoice, but be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, friends, we live in a day where uh, a day today where young adults who abstain from sexual immorality prior to marriage is now seen as weird and foolish. You ask, why would anybody live that way? Why would anybody live in such a way? Why not live to please yourself and appease those desires that you feel? And they're mocked and they're insulted because of it. Why would anybody live this way? Because as believers, what we see from the scriptures is that the total giving of oneself in intimacy in a life uniting act is meant to be only in a life uniting commitment of marriage. That's the intimacy that honors the Lord. And it's done in the commitment of marriage that honors Him. But to the world, that's foolish. And believers are mocked for their uh, uh, antiquarian beliefs about this. But friends, remain faithful to purity, to God-honoring life that He has called you to. Even as you see so much immorality celebrated around you, friends, God knows what's best for us. He knows the way that is best for you. And that's not by being controlled by your desires, but by controlling them and submitting to his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And you know, nobody enjoys what Peter is talking about here, about being insulted. Nobody enjoys going through uh, insult and, and, and mockery and scorn and slander or character assassination. Nobody wants to face that. Nobody wants to face physical pain and persecution. Let's be clear that Peter is not saying just go and seek those things out. 
But friend, know that the Lord Jesus Christ has experienced that pain. And He identifies with that pain and that hardship. He knows what you are going through. He is with you. And the Holy Spirit is leading you through those fiery trials. And the Lord God will see you through. And out of that storm and out of that mess and even through it, He will bless you. I ask, well, how how is he going to bless me? I don't mean eventually if you make it through, he's going to bless you financially or everything's going to be smooth the rest of your life if you make it through. That's not what I mean. But he'll bless you by having a nearness to you. You will have a nearness to the one who loves you and cares for you. The one suffering insult for the sake of Christ, that will actually bring you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ who knows what you are going through. That is the blessing that he is speaking of here. The blessing of a more intimate and close fellowship with the Lord. Look what he says. He says, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That's the blessing. The blessing of a more intimate and close fellowship with the Lord. So take heart, brothers and sisters. Take heart, the Lord is near to you in your righteous suffering. The fourth way in which we, the fourth principle in which we can also uh, not just survive but grow in our suffering is don't suffer for your own wrongdoing. That should go without saying, right? Uh, You wonder, (laughs) Peter, what are you thinking? Well, apparently somebody needed this word. And I think that's true today as well, right? Peter tells us not to suffer for your own wrongdoing. Look what he says in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. In other words, you should not suffer for your own wrong choices. He's saying, look, if you commit these acts, these acts of giving into sin and you murder and you steal or you participate in evil or you meddle, then you actually deserve judgment. He says, but that shouldn't be you, believer, right? Don't suffer for your own foolish and wrong, sinful decisions. Avoid them. Charles Spurgeon said, an ounce of sin will hurt you far more than 10 million tons of suffering. An ounce of sin will hurt you far more than 10 million tons of suffering. We kind of think the other way, right? I'd rather just give in to an ounce of sin than go through suffering. Well, that's not the way of the Lord. A, a week or two ago, I was watching a show. Uh, a man was traveling through Europe, and it was a travel show. Which I guess I've gotten to that age where I watch travel shows now. Oh, uh, well. I guess I'll have to get past that. But he was traveling around Europe and he stopped in a, in in a, in a gold smith or something where they were, they were working with gold to purify it. And and, uh, they were showing the process that the gold went through and it was really ugly going in. Because you have gold mixed with all of these impurities and it goes into the fire and it melts it and then he scraped away the top. And he did this a number of times until it was pure. And it comes out a bar of pure gold. And what that fire was doing was it was exposing what was there. Fire exposes what is there. It shows what's truly there. It tests and it proves what is really there. Is it really gold? Then it's going to come through that fire pure. And, And you know, when we're thinking about our lives and our walk with Christ, when we face trials, it shows what's really there. It shows what we really trust in. It shows what you are really made of. And that's what Peter is showing us here. Is our faith genuine? Well, we'll see if that's the case in the midst of the furnace. Friends, what gives your life meaning? Is it your circumstances? Is it your job, your position? Is it your bank account? Is it your relationships? Is it seeing your kids do well? All of those things are really good. 
But I remember reading about an elderly couple who felt like their lives were meaningless. And there was an article written about them and how courageous they were for committing physician-assisted suicide. And the article was written talking about the last meal that they had together of steak and lobster, and they ate the meal, they laid down, and the physician kills them. And they had interviewed them before, and they were talking about how, well, they'd gotten older, and they, 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 they could not do the things they wanted to do anymore. They thought that life was meaningless. They felt like there was nothing else to live for. But friends, understand this. Whatever you may feel like your life is becoming meaningless. Maybe you think it's because of your age. Maybe you think it's because of your sickness. Or maybe you failed in some way. And you feel like life is meaningless. It's because something besides God has become ultimate. And your trust is not in Him. It's in your circumstances or it's in something else. But you know what? The one true God is different than that. Faith in Him, commitment to Him, will take the heat of any furnace. It will take the heat of any fiery trial. So when we go through fiery trials, when we're in the midst of the furnace, and you're thinking, and you begin to think, well, what's the point of all this? My life seems so meaningless. It's the one true God reminding you that you place your faith, you place your trust in something or someone else. When you're tempted to doubt and think that life is not worth living, what's the point of enduring? It's the Lord actually gently reminding you that you are loving and living for something else more than Him. Why is it that relationships break apart? Why is it that people walk away from the professions of faith? Why is it that that marriages fail and, and all of these things happen today? It's because they did not love the Lord enough. Their trust was in something of the world. Whether those things be finances, whether those things be relationships, they could not bear the heat on their own. But you know, friends, our Lord Jesus Christ took on the ultimate fiery trial for you. By living a perfect life, by dying on the cross and by rising from the dead, Jesus not only faced the ultimate fiery trial, he had conquered it so that you can have joy in the midst of whatever situation and whatever circumstance you find yourself in today. So if you're tempted to think, Oh, I failed so much in this way. Whatever this way may be for you, whether it's a relationship or something else, job or whatever it may be, know that it's the Lord gently and lovingly showing you that He loves you, that He cares for you, and your life has meaning. Your life has value. And trust in Him ultimately, and He will see you through whatever fiery trial you may face. Because Jesus faced the ultimate fiery trial on our behalf. Tim Keller, a pastor, put it this way. When people say life is meaningless because I'm old, life is meaningless because I'm sick, life is meaningless because I'm separated, life is meaningless because I failed, it means your trust, your false gods have failed. They've died. Do you know why? They can't take the heat of reality. There's only one God who can. There's only one God who can never, ever, ever So brothers and sisters here today, going through difficulties, know that the Lord God is with you in the midst of your fiery trial. Know that he loves you, know that he cares you, and he will lead you through. And if you look to him, you find your joy in him, you're rooted in him, then you will experience a nearness and a closeness of him being right there with you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we come before you now this morning. Father, we see so many of these other things that we have trusted in. Whether it be in our own good doing, whether it be in our own good works, our own reputation or or material things that we have trusted in above you. Father, forgive us for those errors. Forgive us for those sins. Forgive us for those shortcomings. And Father, please give us the strength to look to you in this time. Lord, we thank you that 
when we face these fiery trials, your word doesn't just give us these principles to survive, but actually to see them how see how you use them for good in our own lives. Yes, Lord, we do pray for deliverance from evil. We pray for deliverance from these difficulties. But ultimately, Father, may you bless us with perseverance and an intimacy with you. And Lord, if there are any here today who have not trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior, may they do so today, knowing that Jesus has faced the ultimate fiery trial on their behalf. And how because of his life, death, and resurrection and their faith in him and what he's done, they do not need to face the fires of hell for eternity. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the fact that we can go through hardship and you actually use it for good. We pray these things in Jesus' name.